You want to see something cool? After the XT IDE prompt here, you can see that this IBM 5150 is running FreeDOS. FreeDOS 1.3 to be precise. Now, this isn't something that I was originally going to make a video about, but getting it installed on here was a bigger ordeal than I had expected, and along the way, I learned a number of things that might be useful to share. I mean, I even sort of made my own mini distribution of FreeDOS to make this even easier that I've linked below, but we'll get to that later. If you're wondering why I would even bother with FreeDOS on here, there is a very simple answer, and it's actually because I put one of these in here, but that's a topic deserving of its own video soon. Today, I just want to focus on FreeDOS itself and teaching you how to put it on a PC or XT class system like an IBM 5150. First, I want to cover the idea of alternative DOS environments. IBM partnered with Microsoft when releasing the IBM PC to create the software product PC DOS to use as the operating system. But the PC was designed to run other software, such as CPM86 though, and didn't attempt to place any restrictions on what could be booted. This wasn't all that unusual for the time. Another example could be seen on Radio Shack's TRS-80s, which could be purchased with the first party Tris DOS, but could be used with third party software like LDOS. Unlike the TRS-80 though, the PC shipped with software embedded in the hardware that could do some of the heavy lifting, the BIOS. This would provide a software interface to some of the hardware, making it easier for any software to be written without needing to know the complete inner workings of the hardware. Now, the most significant alternative DOS for the PC would have just been MS-DOS, which was Microsoft's branded version of PC-DOS and was nearly identical. While it would be relatively easy to create a DOS that can boot on the PC, it would be another challenge entirely to get other companies to support writing software for it. Many programs run from a DOS would be written to utilize raw assembly code, the BIOS, and functions provided by the DOS with different kinds of programs more heavily utilizing different aspects of that. But this would mean most PC software would be written for the more ubiquitous PC DOS available with the PC, making the development of alternative DOSs difficult. You would need to be compatible with PC DOS software to be even remotely competitive. This did eventually happen though, when DR-DOS was released by Digital Research, who made CPM. This was a PC-compatible alternative operating system for PCs that could run software already developed and sold without needing any modifications. There were not many other competitors who achieved this though, as this was a very difficult task. But five years after the release of DR-DOS, development on FreeDOS would begin. FreeDOS is one of those things that's been in the background of computing for a long time now doing heavy lifting that you may not think much about. It's become a sort of de facto minimal bootable OS for doing simple tasks and gets used for things like updating motherboard BIOS, running enterprise or industrial applications, and put in embedded systems. But if you take a step back and look at it from a different perspective, it's quite the impressive project. It is a fully MS-DOS compatible operating system that has been getting infrequent but regular updates, with its most recent being this year. It has had some ambitious goals as well that have improved upon the standard DOS experience in a number of ways. It has an incredibly robust translation system allowing it to be used in different languages, package management for installing core programs, and inclusion of features found in extensions like the command history and tab completion in 4DOS. It also maintains distribution methods for flash drives, CDs, and floppy disks. FreeDOS may not pull at the nostalgic strings for people when it comes to vintage computers, but it offers some things that may be worth considering. For me, the thing that pushed me over the edge of wanting to try it was the inclusion of FAT32 support in the 8086 kernel, which just came out in the last release at the right time to completely derail a few projects I was working on because it would be such a useful feature in the right setup. Despite having 8086 support though, getting it working on a system of that type was much more complicated than I would have guessed. Compared to modern operating systems, FreeDOS is very lightweight and simple, but for vintage systems, that's not the case. The base install size, for instance, is rated at 20 megabytes, which is practically unfathomable for a 5150. That is for the normal version though, but the specialized floppy disk release still clocks in at 10.3 megabytes once everything is installed, which means that just the OS wouldn't fit on the PC XT with its original 10 megabyte hard drive I picked up in a previous video. 
If it is an option for you, that could be solved by putting something like an XT IDE in the computer with a larger modern drive, but getting the data on there is still another issue. The 10.3 megabyte install would have to be split over 29 360K double density five and a quarter inch floppy disks if you have a system like mine still using the original drives. They don't even offer 360K floppy images because it would be absurd to try that. But even with something like a GoTech, you still wouldn't want to do it. FreeDOS uses an installer program called Slicer to minimize the disks needed, compressing that installed file size down to only 7.2 megabytes to put on the disks, which sounds good on paper. For a more appropriate system, like a 46 with a 1.44 megabyte drive, this would require only six disks. I actually tried using PCEM to install these files onto a virtual machine with an 8088 processor to get a copy of the full install, but I gave up after letting it run for about five hours. The 5150's processor just isn't up to the task of decompressing all those files. So the install is both too big to reasonably fit on original media and packaged in a way that would take an impractical amount of time to install anyway. I'm not exactly sure how you're expected to install the 8086 version after this testing. The only method that seems to make any sense is to use a virtual machine with a better processor, install the 8086 version instead, and then write the disk image to something that you can boot. And I did get help with that from one of my patrons to do that, and I'm very appreciative of it. But I wasn't satisfied with that being the answer, so I decided to dig deeper. I wanted to know, what is taking up all of that space in FreeDOS, and how much of it can be removed? So I did another VM stall and I pulled out all of the files to take a look at. The most immediate thing that hits you when you start looking at the FreeDOS files is just how much documentation there is within the install. Vintage DOSes would come with a book made of dead trees to have all of this included, but that hasn't been the most efficient way to provide that for decades now. Also, the documentation is available in multiple languages, which means that the data is duplicated multiple times. The biggest source of this are four help documents for the AMB ebook reader application. These files aren't compressed and take up 3.7 megabytes of the install, amounting to more than one third of its total size. This is a modern program and file format, which is cool in its implementation, but for a vintage 8086 install is definitely overkill. Removing that gets the uncompressed 10.3 megabytes down to 6.6 .6 megabytes, or 19 disks down from 29. The next biggest thing is the 2.7 megabyte FreeCom folder under bin. The command com processor is available in many different languages, but each one is provided as a separate program. Now, the different translations in FreeDOS are going to end up having varying levels of support on vintage systems, and the original PC is extremely limited. The MDA and CGA cards offered with the 5150 have fixed character sets in ROM that can only display these glyphs. Any languages not represented in here likely aren't usable on a computer like this. And for some history, the standard at the time would have been to release different language versions of the software as a whole, rather than try to include them all in one with redundant code like this. So I focused on making an English version here, and that actually means the entire FreeCom folder can be removed. In the default install for FreeDOS, the English version of CommandCom is duplicated three times in different places, when you really only need one. One of these is in FreeCom, one in bin, and one in the root. Removing all of the FreeCom folder and the root command com gets it down to 3.8 megabytes, or 11 disks. And if you replace the command com program with one for your language before installing, at this point, most users probably would never know anything was removed from this install. However, it could be even smaller, and to be 8086 practical, should be. But there aren't any other easy targets left, so stuff removed from here on gets a bit more hacky and has lower returns. The rest of the doc folder is the next biggest thing, at 1.7 megabytes. It's no paper manual, but you could read all that on your phone if needed, so that can go. The NLS folder contains all of the translations of applications for the different languages FreeDOS supports, but it isn't needed for English, so that's 377k gone. We may as well lump the 246k help folder in there as well, since we removed the other docs and it's mostly duplicate translations as well. We're already well off the beaten path at this point, so there isn't much reason to keep the FreeDOS packaging information around anymore. We can lose 111k by dropping those. 
the CPI folder has a bunch of files named EJ that I'm not completely sure what do, but they seem to be related to the translation stuff, and at least CGA works fine for me without them, so there's 116k down. With all the documentation and translation stuff removed, it's actually extremely close to fitting on a single 1.44 megabyte disk, or five 360k disks, which puts it nearly on par with MS-DOS 5.0 now. But there is definitely more that can go, because not all of the included programs can even run on an 8086. Looking in bin and sorting by size, we see gzip 386 right up at the top, taking 119k. That can be removed from any system since there's also a non-386 version as well, and now you could definitely fit it on a 1.4 meg disk. But for 8086, there's still more that can go. All possible boot kernels are stored in here, and we should move the kernel 86 version to the root and replace the one there to make sure this is actually bootable on an 8086, and we can go ahead and remove the others. There are a bunch of other things here that we can take out for various reasons. Edlin32, country.sys, both slicers, fdimples, amb, and other obvious package and translation files, but that only gets it down to 1.1 megabytes or three disks. Now, the reality is that the disks won't perfectly fit 360k, and you're gonna end up with four of them. And that's as small as I could get it without sacrificing features, which was a line I really didn't want to cross. I think that would probably be a fairly reasonable size, especially if this were being officially packaged and sold like that in the era. But I still wanted to make it smaller, and using some other tricks, I got it down to just two disks. When I very first set out to install FreeDOS on a 5150, I thought it would be best to make a minimum viable boot disk just to set up the hard drive and then transfer all of the OS files through another medium. If you've played around with formatting tools on DOS, you may know that you can make a floppy disk bootable with the sys command. This transfers over the command com and some other files that get you a bare minimum usable system. Everything else included with a DOS install is just there to make using the computer easier and could be considered extra, so you can make a mostly empty boot disk with a small selection of other programs added to it. With that in mind, after some experimentations with other ways of transferring data, I ended up really liking using Zmodem over Serial, and it's a pretty good fit for this, because nearly any system you're likely to install FreeDOS on will probably have something like the Tecmar Captain I've installed in this 5150 that will give you more RAM and extra ports like Serial. Zmodem is just a protocol for sending files over serial that many programs implement, and that you can still get working on modern systems today. So it seemed like an ideal solution. There are a few Zmodem capable programs for DOS out there, but I settled on public domain Zmodem to include with the files I'm releasing for legally obvious reasons. I eventually abandoned the full install over serial idea I started out with because I couldn't get it to work at a faster speed than 9600 baud, which was probably going to take about four hours to transfer everything. But for just a couple of disks worth of data, it made a lot more sense. Going this route, I decided to make a boot disk that could format a hard drive and transfer files, and another disk with the ZM executable and whatever other files I felt were most critical that would fit. Now in the end, with what I was able to include on the two disks, you could probably have a fully functional DOS environment, but I'm not well versed enough with FreeDOS to say that for sure. Continuing on though, since I wanted to make this all as self-contained as I could, I ended up writing my own sort of installer to help automate copying all of the files, as well as a small help document for Zmodem. I can't really help automate the Zmodem transfer itself since it will depend on your modern system as well, but I tried to provide as much help to make it as easy as possible. So that is how I ended up being able to install FreeDOS on an IBM 5150. I kind of hope that I've made an error and that there is another more official way to do it than my chainsaw method and that someone may post it in the comments below. But I'm releasing the 360k disk images I created for this, so you can do it yourself if you want. I've tried to battle test the install as much as possible, but I'm not really looking to support this as a recurring thing, so consider this a very as-is release. Now, with it all done, I'll give you a quick walkthrough of the install process. The files I put together include two disk images you'll need to get on the 360k floppies, and a folder of everything else from the bin folder that wouldn't fit. When you boot the first disk, it will always print out the steps needed to install, and following those should work in most cases. The first thing you need to do is partition your boot drive so you can format it. Go through the options in fdisk to clear out any partitions on the drive that you don't want, and then make a new one to install FreeDOS on. After that, you will need to reboot to have the system update the hard drive information. 
Next, you need to manually format and install the system. This should technically be possible to do in one command with the slash s parameter, but it looks for the files in particular places that I've removed for space here, so you'll need to run both commands separately. The sys command will still complain that it can't find command common root, but it will fall back to the one in the bin folder automatically. Once that is done, you can run setup.bat to start transferring all the files over. A small note here. FreeDOS uses fdconfigsys and fdauto.bat instead of the more standard config.sys and autoexec.bat by default. I put those files for the final install in the install folder, and I did follow that naming convention here. If you want, after the install, you can rename fdconfig and it should work automatically. fdauto can be renamed as well, but you'll need to change the parameter for shell in the config file to match so it will run correctly. I've also modified these files to do fewer things on boot, so it should be a little quicker. After the setup file I made copies all of the files to the hard drive, it will transfer the operating environment to the hard disk and ask for the next disk. After it copies everything from there, the bare bones install is complete. I think it will work here without restarting, but you should probably just do it anyway. To copy the rest of the files for the install, you should navigate to the FreeDOS bin folder. You can run type zm-help.txt to see the instructions I left for sending the files over zmodem. The commands will be somewhat specific to your system, but if you're using COM1 at 9600 baud like me, then the example one should work. In Linux, I'm using SZ to send files to the 5150 here, and I've mentioned a compatible Windows program in the documentation. A note here from my testing, not every USB serial adapter will work here. Matter of fact, out of all of my serial adapters, only one was compatible with both the Tecmar Captain in this computer and the AST6 Pack Plus in my Compaq Portable. I'm guessing there are some voltage level issues with the other adapters, so if it doesn't work for you, you may need a different USB serial adapter. Once you get it working though, I timed the transfer of the rest of the install at about 12 minutes, so it isn't too bad. After that, it's done. It's a fully functional install of a modern operating system on a computer from 1981, which is just cool all on its own. Now that I have FreeDOS installed though, I've been able to give it a little bit of a test drive on my IBM 5150 and I've tried to see how well it works. FreeDOS does use more RAM than pretty much every other DOS option. I did some testing with MS-DOS 3.3 and 5.0 with and without 4DOS loaded to give them some more of the same features as FreeDOS, and I saw it using around 75 to 85k more RAM than the other DOSes, which is definitely enough that you could notice if you try and run a huge program. But I wouldn't be surprised if there aren't too many on a 5150 that need that much RAM that would still be enjoyable to run. Now, game performance wise, there should be no difference at all, since most games would be written in assembly language and run direct operations on the CPU, bypassing the DOS altogether. I booted FreeDOS on a Tandy 1000TX while testing, and it not only ran Planet X3 just fine, but Top Bench, written by the talented Jim Leonard, nailed exactly what computer it was running on, so raw performance is definitely the same. Now, some applications that use more DOS system calls than hardware ones may be slowed down a bit. To kind of test this, I tried launching and immediately quitting Vim in PCEM with different DOSes installed, and FreeDOS was just slightly slower, but not enough that I would really have an issue with it. And as a side note, you will definitely want any other text editor like Vim or Mr. Ed installed because the version of Edit that FreeDOS includes is constantly doing full screen redraws and is brutally slow on a CGA computer. Now, in my testing, I haven't had any issues with compatibility either. Pretty much every program I've thrown at it has run just fine, as well as loading drivers in the config file. I haven't had as much seat time with it yet as I would like to say with certainty the compatibility is perfect on here, but so far it does seem to be that way. And as far as my main reason to install FreeDOS on here? Well, I don't want to spoil it, but let's just say that FAT32 support has been everything I wanted. <laughs> That is it for now though. This video didn't end up being at all what I expected it would be, but I'm just hopeful that I was able to do something that may be able to help other people who want to run FreeDOS on much older PCs. Getting started with this was really difficult for me with all sorts of chicken and the egg problems that I've skipped in this video that you hopefully won't have to deal with. As long as you can write the disk images I put up to floppies, then it should be possible for you to have a much easier time than I did. Well. 
I hope you enjoyed this journey of installing FreeDOS. If you did, you may want to subscribe because it will be coming back again very soon. And if you want to support the channel, I am on Patreon. But that is it for the moment, and I will see you next time.